Hey, what's up you guys? Sophia and I are doing a little bit of a hike to go take some uh, large format dry plates. I've got three zebra glass dry plates. Um, we're in Big Thompson Canyon, uh, which is the canyon you drive up to Estes Park from. Hopefully the audio here works. I kind of wanted to talk about the importance of dry plates in the history of photography. And it's kind of fitting being that the Stanley Hotel is in Estes Park and the Stanley brothers made their fortune on dry plates. Uh, from my understanding, the zebra dry plates uh, made by Lost Light, again, I'll have a link to the Etsy store down below, um, uses the exact same recipe that the Stanley brothers did. And now I really wanna talk about why dry plates are important in the history of photography. Um, as you can see, we're pretty light. This Peak Design 30 liter is really fantastic for carrying this large format camera. I've got everything packed in there. I'm pretty comfortable. The most cumbersome thing in my possession is my tripod. I really need to get a carbon fiber large format tripod, but they're expensive. But basically, before the advent of the silver gelatin process, or dry plate, um, it was the wet collodion process. And the wet collodion process really wasn't that great. I mean, no, the photos are stunning and the people who do that work is amazing, but like for mobility, like what we're doing right now, wasn't that great. Um, the wet collodion process involved taking a plate and you'd pour a syrup on it, a collodion syrup, and then you would put it in a silver bath. And the silver bath contained things like ether and alcohol and, and basically you're putting the silver on the plate <laughs> But you had a time limit before it dried up. And if it dried up, no photo. And you had to do your development and your fixing on site. Everything had to be done on site. So you had to carry all your chemistry with you. The dry plate process revolutionized that. The dry plate process suspended the silver crystals, which are what's sensitive to light, in what's called photographic gelatin now, which is how the zebra plates are made. Check out his channel though, I'll link it up above. I'll link his channel up above. Check out his channel, he, he runs down how he does the process, it's absolutely amazing. But, what it meant is you could load your film holders, go out into the field, take your photos, and then bring them back to your darkroom to develop it, which is what Nick and... Which is what Nick and I did the other night when we were taking photos and um and testing out the Pocket 3. We're not using the Pocket 3 right now, we're using a GoPro 8. Um, but this is absolutely a stunning view and I thought it would be perfect for some dry plates. Um, the Zebra dry plate holder is amazing. I do need to get a version two. He was having a huge sale on it, but I didn't quite have the funds in time, but that's okay. And I figured it'd be good to bring the dog out here to go on this little adventure with me. So we're gonna climb up this steep embankment and I will uh, talk a little bit more about dry plates. Who's enjoying their time in the mountains with dad? She's such a little fantastic dog. Perfect size, 35 pounds. But anyway, so the ability to pack your dry plates, go out, take your photos, stuff like that right there, and then bring them back to your dark room kind of meant a democratization of photography. And so from the dry plate, which is actually on a piece of glass, uh, Kodak, I believe, invented celluloid film, revolutionizing. So then you get celluloid large format film, and then we get like 120 format, 620 format, 35 millimeter, all on the basis of suspending your silver in gelatin instead of a uh, collodion. Absolutely revolutionized everything. The other thing too, is with the gelatin, you can add multiple layers making your film more sensitive. My experience with the wet collodion process is it's at about 0.5 ISO, which is super slow. And that's why you hear those stories about like photos taking forever back in the day. That's why people didn't smile. I mean, even at 0.5, it isn't that long. You had like 10 to 15 minutes to take the photo and develop it. 
before your collodion and silver dried up. So yeah, um, there was no 30 minute exposures, at least not to my knowledge. I could be wrong if someone knows more than me, correct me, but that's my experience with collodion. Now the dry plates that I've made before, the tin types using um, liquid light from Rockland, they're about one ISO, still pretty slow. But the Zebra plates are two ISO, which is still pretty slow when you compare them to 100 ISO or 3400 ISO, which is I think the fastest black and white film I've found so far. You could always push them and pull them in the dark room though. I think I found our first photo, you guys. What do you think about that? I think that's a pretty cool vista. Maybe try to get the, the road and the canyon there. Let's get set up. Actually at f22 right now just checking that everything is relatively in focus and then we're gonna put it on f64 for the actual photo so you can see the road and some cars but everything looks pretty good so again we're using it's called light meter free it's really good um, so we're at f64 right now to take that photo of 64 and for proper exposure right at that peak we're looking at yeah about 15 seconds for everything we've got some shadows but like they'll play all right yeah 15 seconds it looks like for that whole photo two iso f64 15 seconds so that's that's totally doable let's get this set up so again we're um we're using the zebra four by five version one dry plate holder. Both of these are unexposed because the white is out. They're absolutely fantastic little setup. But basically, just like any other cut film holder, you just pop it open, slide it in, and that's what we're gonna take a photograph of. But the advent of the dry plate is extremely important to the, the democratization of, pull it all the way out, of photography. It allowed photography to be put into anyone's hands. You didn't have to know a lot about chemistry in order to do it. It's a little bit windy today. But it allowed anyone to do it and then you get these one hour photos, all that stuff that starts setting up to develop your film and it really just kind of put cameras in the hands of every person. We started our exposure, 15 seconds. But the democratization of photography, and that's really where things start to explode. That's where video comes from. I mean, the old film reels, being able to take video wouldn't be possible without the silver gelatin process. You couldn't do a wet plate process for a motion picture. It just wouldn't work. So unlike my video with Nick, I actually do have to use the dark cloth out here because the sun is directly behind me and you wouldn't be able to see the ground glass if not. But the democratization of photography. And so you get motion pictures, you get celluloid film, which is revolutionary. You could almost debate that uh, celluloid is almost as important as the silver gelatin process itself. I'd argue that silver gelatin is more important um, because Again, that means you could store film. You could make a bunch of plates, take them out later, bring them back and develop them at your own whimsical. You didn't have to carry a dark room with you everywhere you went. Now, if you look at modern wet plate photographers, they have 
some ultralight dark rooms. It's pretty awesome. But back in the day, we're talking glass everything, wooden boxes. Things were heavy. It was hard. And the other part, too, is temperature. If it's too hot, your collodion gets a little less syrupy. If it's too cold, it's kind of frozen. It's not frozen, but it doesn't work the same way. You're very constrained by temperatures, at least my experience in the few times I have done wet the wet collodion process. Dry plates, I don't have those things to worry about. I can just go out, take my photos, and develop them whenever I feel like it. Now, I do plan on sitting down and doing a full breakdown of what I think of the Zebra plates, so a full review of them, the ISO accuracy, what I've talked to with the maker of the plates and have discovered and like how clear they really are. And so that's gonna require some high resolution scans and you're gonna see the flaws in my work too. But I've never been one to shy away from showing you the flaws. Absolutely beautiful out here today. It's hard to tell, it's hard to tell it's autumn until the breeze kicks up. So I'm actually out here on Armistice Day, Veterans Day, Armistice Day. It'll always be Armistice Day to me. Um, but going back to that, the process, two ISO, F64, 15 second to four minute exposures. It makes me really choose what photo I'm taking very carefully. It's a nice change from digital. It's not for everyone though, and I understand that, but it is the roots of where all of us photographers began. It's really hard to express just how comfortable <laughs> this Peak Design 30 liter is with a full load. We're talking three glass plates, two film holders, big wooden tripod, my big heavy dark cloth, and that Burke and James Field camera, which is not the lightest camera in the world. On top of my normal EDC, and I'm very comfortable. The only the only problem I have with camera bags is they don't have camel backs. Be cool if someone put a waterproof compartment in that I could put my camel back in. And that way I don't have to lug around a jug of water. Oh look, there's some snow. You can't see it on the GoPro, I'm sure, but I've had some snowstorms up here already. But yeah, peak design bag. We gotta do a full review on that as well as the dry plate holders, and then the conversion video. I haven't done those yet, so I will definitely make a video on that. Look how beautiful this is. It's less bears I'm afraid of, and mountain lions are what I'm scared of. Uh, this little one though, she's on patrol. This isn't a game to her, it's a job. So I know I can always bring her with me, and I'll be a-okay. I'll have to come up earlier next time. It's <laughs> I made it to the top, but the lighting was too harsh for the photo I wanted. So I'll have to get that early morning light next time. I think it'll be better if I do it that way. But that's okay. It was a good hike. We got that one photo. There's a couple spots on the way down the mountain that I definitely want to hit. Um, the dam store for one, kind of a local icon, and then probably a photo of the Narrows which is the part of the canyon that narrows down. But look at these vistas. It's just absolutely stunning. I'm so lucky to have been born in this state. It's currently 31 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, yes, I use the Imperial method. If you want to know what that is, I have no clue. I'm going to assume it's close to zero in Celsius because 32 is freezing in Fahrenheit which is zero in Celsius, but I use the Imperial system because I prefer it, at least for measuring temperature. So another interesting thing about the, the silver gelatin method, the dry freight process, um, they're UV sensitive. They're blue light sensitive. They don't really pick up red light. Um, so you have to take care with your UV index. And when I was talking to the creator of the zebra dry plates, you know, he was saying that at certain UV indexes, which we have a lot of here in Colorado because of the elevation, especially up here, you know, around six or seven UV index, you start um, 
You read them at three ISO instead of two ISO. In the studio, you use two ISO. We will be doing studio strobe videos with dry plates, um, just to show you that the process can work a lot like a regular camera if done right. Um, but yeah, so up at this elevation, like I would have probably have to read way up there in the harsh light at three ISOs. I just didn't like the shadows the way that they were playing when I um, was taking a look at the top. It's just too sunny or too dark and I couldn't get like a really good mid reading. So I'll have to come up when the, the light's not quite as harsh as it is currently for the specific photo that I wanted to take. And because these aren't digital and I don't have an almost infinite number of them, <laughs> I'm a little more cautious at what photos I do end up taking, but just look at this. So we're doing landscape photography in an old style. It looks sepia instead of black and white, and we're using large format. So obviously the comparisons to Ansel Adams comes up. I like Ansel Adams a lot, and I respect his work. The man was using a big heavy wooden camera and a big heavy wooden tripod and going all over Yosemite. Currently the town I live in is hosting his images of the Japanese internment camps at the museum. I need to go and check that out. Maybe we'll do a video on that. But a lot of people don't understand that Ansel Adams did a lot of post editing in the dark room, dodging, burning, the way he set up his images, contrasting. There was a lot of editing involved, darkroom Photoshop, essentially. And I've had a lot of people tell me like, oh, I take photos like Ansel Adams. I don't do any editing. It's like Ansel Adams did a lot of editing. Um, I always tell them to buy his printmaking book because he goes into pretty good explanation of uh, how he edits his photos. Um, but F64, uh, you don't get that on smaller than large format. And I really do want to get an eight by 10. I know he mostly, took photos on four by five, but I'm taking direct positives, essentially. I'm not making prints. Um, I can make digital prints with these, but I'm just, I like the direct positive aspect. It adds a certain look that you don't get. It adds a certain mystique that every image is unique. There isn't a million copies of these prints going around, so that's why I try to make them all positives. But yeah, Ansel Adams did a lot of editing in the darkroom. Now you know. So what I really regret is I did um, elopement photos of the Crystal Mill. I'll throw up a picture of it real quick. And I regret that I didn't hike in my uh, large format camera. Granted, I was bringing digital camera and we were staying in the cabins in the town, which don't have electricity, by the way. It's pretty awesome. Um, no internet, no electricity. It was absolutely amazing. And this would have been the perfect process up there. But I was dumb. Oh, actually, I just didn't have the, uh, the ability to carry my digital camera, my clothes, food, and this large format camera. But in the next year, maybe next summer, I'd like to get up there and do some large format photos, uh, four by five of the Crystal Mill. It's one of the most photographed places in Colorado. Don't drive the road though, it's terrible. Terrible road, absolutely terrible. It's a two way road that's a single lane. It's terrifying. We just hiked in. It's like a five mile hike, it was nothing. So this is the spot in the Narrows I wanted to stop, and I think that I want a little more contrast between the light and dark. So we're gonna bring this up a hair. And that way we have the rocks in the light and in the dark. We'll probably take this one at F22. I mean, it's all about the same area that I don't have to really do it at, you know, a full F64 because there's not a whole lot going on there. I mean, the rocks are really pretty. I think the rocks are pretty. You might not think the rocks are pretty. I do. Though the road might add more drama to the shot. Yeah, let's do that. That road just in that bottom corner. Beautiful. And we're gonna do my light reading. Should be about a 15 second exposure by my calculations. We're gonna check and make sure. Again, white out means that this is not the exposed one. This is the exposed one. Pull this out. So. And what's cool is there's a lot of old photos of the canyon in this sepia tone that were taken through these processes.
And so it's, it'll be cool to compare them against what I'm doing. So this is the photo I was talking about, the dam store. It's very, very iconic. We're using my homemade dry plate holder. Uh, this says, side says plate. I don't know if you can see it. And this is the backing. It's important why, and I'll show you when I make this. But we're gonna take this photo at F64 because it's super, super bright. And I didn't exactly bring an ND filter with me. But F64 is where we're gonna take that photo at. Close the lens, charge it, and then let's take our light reading. F64 puts us at a 12 second exposure, which is just absolutely perfect. That flag is gonna look all flappy. It'll be dope. But with these homemade ones, you have to make sure that the plate side is the side that goes into the camera facing forward. So backing is the back side of the camera. These ones are a bit thinner than the zebra ones, but that's because they only hold one photo, whereas the zebra plate holders hold two photos. So then we'll pull that out. Drop my camera, my GoPro, we'll pull that out. Do one last light reading to make sure. Then we have all three photos I set out to take today. I'll see you guys in the dark room. Good chance that this is gonna be a bit grainy and the audio might not be great. We're just using a Rode um, mic up here. I don't know where my wireless mic is at, so hopefully it's not too echoey, but we are back in the dark room, as you can see from the red light. I'm using the uh, RBG, um, the newer, the newer RBG, which we do have a video review on. I'll link it right up there. But we have my setup right here for developing and yeah, it's, it'll be a bit dark. Let me see if I can bring that up. Again, the footage might be a bit grainy, but this is not a great camera for, uh, <laughs> for recording in dark. And this is the Sony a6100. So it's not the Osmo that we were using last week video which i will there's a review for that I'll link down below um but yeah so let's uh let's get into this let's let's see how these images came out you guys let's see if i can get this tripod to work i'm using a little tiny baby tripod uh we're gonna start out with the image that i put in the uh the homemade plate holder if i remember correctly this is the uh image of the dam store in loveland or just west of loveland so we're gonna see how that comes out and actually i don't think that this is the image that i thought it was let's see if i can show it on the screen here if you can see it let's see it already starting to come through um I may be wrong, this may not be the damn store. No, it is, it is the damn store. You can see the sign. I can see the sign. We're working on the second photograph. Um, this one looks like it's the one of the Canyon Narrows that we took. I hope you guys remember that. Let's uh, bring this around and take a look. The Canyon Narrows and then the damn store is in the fixed bath. But the Canyon Narrow is looking really good. We've got about two minutes or so left on it. Um, I'm really excited with how much detail is coming through. I really cannot commend these Zebra dry plate holders. Like, they are just absolutely amazing. I will definitely be ordering another one. I've got the third plate in now. Um, I'm going to keep, I'm going to move towards the light so you can see. So I've got the third plate in now. And so this is that big vista, the very first photograph we took on that little hike with Sophia. And I think I have four or five plates left. So I'm gonna have to order more this week because I really wanna get into the studio over Christmas break with these plates and do a demonstration of using studio strobes to take portraits with them, which is totally doable. I've done it at one ISO. These are a full stop faster than at one ISO. So I think I can actually do a little bit more dramatic lighting than what I've done in the past. So I'm really excited about that, but let's take a look at this photo. Again, I'm really sorry about how terrible the grain is and how dark it is. Um, I should have used the A61 or the, the A7 III for video. Um, realistically, I have a smaller lens, a wider lens for it too, so it'd probably been easier. This is just the one that I know and I have set up for video. And then you've got this guy over here, actually. Maybe that helps a little bit now. 
Then we got this guy over here in the fixed path of the Narrows, which is going to look absolutely stunning. And then that one over there. And then once, once we can go into full light again, um, I'll show you them in the wash bath. And then I'll show you them as I wash them to see the detail before I paint them. So stay tuned for that. So lighting is better. Excuse the scruff. It's no shave November and I'm finally giving that a shot. But uh, the next important step is the rinse. And so I usually soak for like 15 minutes and then rinse. Um, but I've noticed a little bit of oranging on the edges when I do that. And that might just be the place, but we're gonna actually test this and that way I can actually show you how they look. So I'm gonna start with the one that's been soaking the longest because it's definitely been soaking longer than 15 minutes. Um, but this is the one of the dam store. And so this is actually the side that we took the photo on, but when I flip it over, it is the positive that'll say the dam store. Um, but yeah, so that's extremely detailed, extremely detailed. Once we paint that black, it's gonna look absolutely marvelous. And we have the next one, which is the photo of the Narrows with the, the trucks. Give that a quick little rinsey rinse. But wait till you see all the details in these rocks. Like the shadow work that's gonna come out of these rocks um, is just going to be absolutely marvelous. But look at, you see all the little cracks and stuff? And then the front side of it, the, the front after we paint it. But like the details there are just, the, the, the black contrast, the contrast is going to be absolutely stunning with these. We've got this final one, which is that huge vista we got a photo of. Oh, I had it upside down. Ooh, ooh. That came out exactly as I was hoping. And this one, I believe we took at F64. It was a couple days ago, so I don't remember exactly what the settings were. But um, the side that we actually took the photo on. And then the back side. Oh, that's a good way to show you. Look at all of those details. I'm going to show you the other plates in that same manner uh, once I'm done rinsing this one off. So th this is the, the, the photo. Yeah, look at that. Look at that detail come through. Oh my goodness. And then I'll show you the, the damn store again as well. That same angle. Look at that. Look at that. Absolutely stunning. Oh, I'm so excited with how these came out. Hey, what's up you guys? So, um, the plates are dry. Let's take a look at them. So we got the Canyon Narrows here. Um, up above is rock, but it's all washed out. But like, look how detailed it is. Oh, it came out absolutely amazing. Let's see if I can do this without the glare. Yeah, I'm really happy with that. Oh, I'm gonna have to paint it again. You can see through it. Is that large? Let's see. Yeah, you can see through it. So I'll have to add more black paint. That's okay. But look at that. Look at those sharp contrasted details. And you can see right where the sun was hitting at. And I think we'll definitely have to do another coat of black because you can still see through it and that's okay and then the final one is the dam store which you can see right through that's okay nothing another coat can't fix but look at how beautiful that is so as you can see, like the, the, the dry plates are absolutely amazing. Zebra plates are fantastic. Again, I'll have a link down below. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any suggestions for any things you would like to see photographed with these plates or testing out filters like the black mist filter or more night photography, let me know down below. I hope this was informative. If you have any questions, just leave a comment below and I'll catch you all on the flip side. Bye.